1944, two generals go head to head in an epic battle. The fate of the Second World War hangs in the balance. US General Omar Bradley and German Field Marshal Walter Nodel may be far apart on the battlefield, but in their minds, they're standing over the same table. Now, two modern-day generals will get inside the heads of Bradley and Modell to unpick their tactics and strategy, their decisions, dilemmas and disasters. A team of military experts compares their equipment, their vehicles and their firepower to reveal just how the Battle of the Bulge was won. After the D-Day landings in Normandy, Allied invasion forces are on a roll. They sweep towards Germany with lightning speed and soon have Berlin in their sight. They think it's all over, but the Germans, as usual, have not read the script. Adolf Hitler hatches a desperate plan to turn the tide of war at the 11th hour. He mobilizes Germany's very last reserves of men and machines for one last giant offensive. The man Hitler picks to run this mission is one of his most successful and loyal generals. Field Marshal Walter Model. Model deserved his name as Hitler's fireman. Again and again, he was thrown into the most difficult places because he was an extremely effective, tough commander. General Sebastian Roberts is an infantry commander and expert strategist in the British Army. He will analyse Walter Model's role in the Battle of the Bulge. Modell was an immensely able staff officer, an imaginative mover, deployer of formations. Switching things fast was one of his hallmarks. Ruthless in command, and particularly ruthless about the enemy and his own subordinate commanders and staff officers. If they weren't cutting the mustard, he sacked them without question. And so he wasn't popular except with his soldiers. And with the rank and file, I think they thought he was their man, a, a soldier's general. When Modell learns of his Führer's audacious plans, he is deeply concerned. Hitler wants to drive a series of armoured spearheads through the thinly held American lines in the Ardennes forest in Belgium. The fast-moving tanks would then dash ahead and capture the crossings over the River Meuse. From the rear, a wave of support troops would sweep up resistance and strengthen the attack. Hitler is convinced that he can finally divide and conquer his enemies. He believes the offensive will drive a crushing wedge between the American commanders, Bradley and Eisenhower, and the British member of their alliance, General Montgomery. But Modell thinks Hitler's plan is far too ambitious. The German generals concerned, Modell and his subordinates and superiors, all recognized that they simply didn't have the military strength to do this. And they proposed instead to Hitler's fury that they should go for a more limited aim, which would be simply to capture the crossings of the Meuse River beyond the mountains of the Ardennes. Rather than trying to reach Antwerp, hundreds of kilometers away, 
Modal would confine his forces closer to home. He would stay east of the river Meuse and launch two prongs of a pincer movement to surround and crush the US forces there. Then they could make a choice. Go for the bigger push that Hitler in, envisaged up to Antwerp or stay where they were and allow the Americans and the British to counterattack them in a cold and bitter winter. It gave them more options. Modell tries to sell his plan to Hitler, hoping to change his mind, as he has done many times before. But not this time. Hitler was insistent. Go for Antwerp. Grudgingly, Modell prepares to do his Führer's bidding. He knows that this is going to be the toughest job he's ever done. His enemy has superior air power, so Modal needs a long stretch of bad weather to keep the Allied bombers on the ground. And his own troops must move extremely fast. To have any hope of success, they need to reach the River Meuse in only four days. But Modal also knows that the choice of battleground will give him his biggest trump card, the element of surprise. The Ardennes is the last place the enemy expect him to attack. The steep and densely wooded terrain forces his tanks to stick to the narrow tracks. This means they can only travel nose to tail and make easy targets. Taking out a single tank at the front could block the way for a whole column of Modal's attacking armor. It's the worst possible country for tanks and all the supporting stuff that you need with tanks. Remember, a force of 200 tanks has a tail that probably takes 15 kilometers of road. And if it's on one road and it's discovered, enemy fighter bombers, you're terribly vulnerable. Attacking through the Ardennes is bound to take the Allies by surprise. But sneaking a quarter of a million men into position right under their noses is a massive challenge for Modal. By December 15th, 1944, Modal's assault force is in place, undetected. 250,000 men, supported by artillery and tanks, lie in wait right in front of the enemy lines. None of them has any idea what's about to happen. Then they receive the order from Modal's HQ. They will attack at dawn. Across the front line from Modal and completely oblivious to the threat is American General Omar Bradley. Somebody once described him as, as a rather a sort of introspective, gentle soul. He takes offence very easily, he's pretty prickly, and I think he's actually a bit insecure. General Julian Thompson has commanded Special Forces operations all over the globe. He's going to analyse Omar Bradley's part in the Battle of the Bulge. His direct experience of fighting was pretty limited. He never saw a battle as a commander until Sicily in 1943, so he's not actually very experienced. General Bradley is using the Ardennes to train his green recruits and let battle-worn veterans recover. One of the reasons they were put there was because it was such a quiet place and there wasn't going to be an attack. There is no warning of the storm of steel that's about to be unleashed. On the evening of December 15th, Bradley's men flocked to a concert by movie star Marlena Dietrich. While just a stone's throw away, the Germans are getting ready to attack. December 16, 1944, 5.30 a.m. For the Germans, it's Null Tag, day zero. Just before dawn, Modal begins the Ardennes offensive with a raging storm of fire from the German artillery guns. Then, out of the mist, comes the sound of armour, the, the tracks clattering, the 
the squeaking noise, the rumble, the crash of the tank guns driving over them, followed by infantry in, in, uh, in their half-tracks, ruthless SS Panzer Grenadiers, um, with their machine guns, grenades, just fighting their way through and, and wiping out everything in their path. The green American soldiers have no idea what's hitting them. Terrifying for a newly arrived soldier who's never been in battle before, who's been told you're in a quiet area and the Christmas turkey is coming up in two days' time. And then this attack comes rolling in on you. Bodel's infantry blitz the American positions with a brand new secret weapon. Until now, an infantryman had to choose between two very different guns. The Germans had at their disposal, okay, these kind of weapons, okay? They had the Mauser bolt-action type rifle, and they had the MP40 submachine gun. The Mauser, because it had a long barrel, it was very good at uh, long distance, but when you cock it, load it, and fire it, cock it, load it, fire it. Not very practical when you're attacking trenches. You only had about five rounds anyway, and uh, soon run out of ammunition. On the other hand, okay, the MP40, okay, had a larger magazine, but wasn't very good at long distance. The bullets are gonna be flying all over the place, you know, dropping low, uh, probably uh, hitting the ground well, well before uh, they get anywhere near the enemy. When it came to assaulting trenches, neither of these weapons were really any good. But German engineers managed to merge the rifle and the machine pistol into a single weapon. It fires accurate single shots at a distance, but at the flick of a switch, it spits out a deadly hail of bullets. Hitler loves the new gun. He names it Sturmgewehr, assault rifle, and issues it to the troops destined for the Ardennes. The assault rifle gives the German infantrymen high precision and immense firepower. It is the ideal weapon for taking on the Americans in their foxholes. In most parts, the German troops smash through the American lines and wreak havoc. Americans tumble back in chaos and either surrender or get killed. By the end of the first day, the Germans have pushed back the American front in an ever-growing bulge, which gives the battle its name. Modell reports to Hitler that, so far, day zero is going to plan. When the Germans break through the US lines, the American in charge is far away from his command post. General Bradley is in Paris, celebrating the promotion of his old friend and current boss, General Eisenhower. Bradley was part of the West Point class of 1915, along with Eisenhower, known as the class that stars fell on, because so many of them became generals, because they were just lucky enough to be born at the right time. He had the ear of Eisenhower. He was a buddy of Eisenhower's. They were both classmates at West Point. They got on. And I think Eisenhower felt comfortable with Bradley, too, in a sense that Bradley tended, though he did occasionally, uh, tended to sort of do as he was told. When the news of the German attacks reaches Bradley, he doesn't take it seriously. He doesn't believe it. He's in uh, with Eisenhower. It's, it's the 16th of... December, when somebody walks in and says the Germans are attacking. And he says, oh, it's just a spoiling attack. They're, they're putting in a spoiling attack is something you do in order to spoil the other fellow's day, in order to put him off his stroke. And so sort of switched off, is he? He doesn't return to his own headquarters until PM 17th. That's 24 hours after he's heard the news. But General Eisenhower immediately sees the threat. He wants to send in two armored divisions one from the north and one from the south, 
to attack the flanks of the German advance. The commander in the south is George Patton, a man that Bradley doesn't get on with. They're totally different characters. Patton is this sort of abrasive, flamboyant, blood and guts, um, swearing all the time, two pistols general. Bradley is rather retiring, quite religious, uh, a bit of a uh, party pooper, I think you'd probably describe him. He's not the most uh, outgoing of people, and he disapproves of Patton. Bradley doesn't want to start a fight with Patton and hesitates to call up his troops. But soon he realizes that he's on the business end of a devastating German attack and that he needs all the help he can get. And what's worse, many of his men are laid up in field hospitals, crippled by a condition brought on by their boots. This is the standard American boot of 1944. Very high, straps around the lower leg, plenty of laces, good gusset here to stop water getting in. And as a really useful feature, they thought about putting the leather rough side out, which means the, the wax, the dubbing, the waterproofing can be absorbed by the leather, giving a really good barrier against water. The German style boot from 1944 it is more like a standard ankle boot. It's simpler and it's made, in this case of the leather, the way we'd normally expect it with the shiny side out. Um, in theory, this isn't as good as the American made boot. Um, the question is which actually is going to function better in a test. Four minutes in, and there's a telltale, slightly cold feeling on the inner part of my right foot, and my right foot's in the American boot. I, I would argue that that right boot has already got a layer of water in it, a, a, a couple of millimetres deep, if not deeper. It's almost like the, the leather is absorbing the water, and then it's coming out on the inside. It's like blotting paper, and it's getting worse by the second. I think this one would need constant attention, and the one thing you don't have is, is time in a military situation to lavish care on your boots. The badly designed American boots lead to a pandemic of trench foot among Bradley's troops in the Ardennes. It's the fact that actually combination of cold and water means that your toes, they lose the circulation. And what then happens is that they die in a really bad case of trench foot. Your feet go numb, take your boots off, take your socks off, and your toes just come away with your socks. With thousands of his men out of action, Bradley's defences are now seriously stretched and there are even more uncomfortable surprises in store. Some of Bradley's troops are not what they seem. A German commando unit has infiltrated the American positions. 400 German soldiers dressed up in US uniforms wearing the dog tags of captured or dead American soldiers. They disguise their own tanks with painted plywood to make them look like American tanks. The phony troops speak English with perfect accents and sneak behind the American lines with ease. There they change signposts, misdirect traffic and sow even more confusion. You wouldn't have thought that war would be an activity which had any rules, but it, it, it does. And one of the things that, that, that is extremely hazardous is if you put on the enemy's uniform and operate behind his lines, then you, you are actually putting yourself up for execution if you get caught. 
the German deception is soon detected. Bradley's men capture some of the imposters. When one of the captured German commandos claims that their mission is to assassinate generals, the Americans start to panic. I mean, Eisenhower spent the next five or six days locked up in, a, in, his, in his headquarters. Um, at one stage, his chief of staff rushed outside and started spraying the gardens with a machine gun because he thought the place was under attack. Um, Bradley travelled around wearing a, a, a greatcoat over his uniform so no one would recognise him. So it caused you know, quite a lot of mayhem uh, among the American high command. While the fake troops sow confusion among the Americans, one of Modal's most formidable assets is leading the charge. The tip of Modal's sharper spearhead is an elite SS Panzer unit of 250 tanks and 3,500 men, the German army's most battle-hardened and fanatical soldiers. Their job is to bring shock and awe to the enemy. Their leader is a 29-year-old SS colonel, the infamous Jochen Piper. Jochen Piper is a fanatical Nazi, a man who will stop at nothing to achieve his Führer's orders. His ruthlessness was beyond contempt. He would have been regarded as a flamboyant, brave, adventurous, successful leader who had the sort of spirit that special forces have. And I suspect that to his own subordinates, he was a bit of a hero figure. He was certainly admired by Hitler and other superiors, and not just for his politics. They didn't come into it. What came into it was his success as a soldier. Piper must fight his way through to the River Meuse before the weather clears and the skies fill with Allied fighter bombers. Once there, he will have to secure crossings for the German support troops that follow. On day two, Piper's tanks reach the village of Malmedy. Here they capture a convoy of retreating Americans. Piper's men round up 113 prisoners and shoot 88 of them. It, it cannot be condoned or justified. But I think it can be understood. How could it have happened? Was it intended as an act of appalling terrorism? I suspect not. I suspect that it was a ruthless and, at the time, casual decision that it's too difficult and would delay us too much to take prisoners. So we went. The news of what the SS have done to the American prisoners spreads like wildfire across the battlefield. The ordinary soldier would have heard about it because the Americans would have made quite certain that he did. And so if, sitting in his foxhole, he's tempted to give in, he might think, well, I don't think I'll give in to these guys because they might kill me, I'll go on fighting. The massacre at Malmedy backfires badly on the Germans. It revives the fighting spirit among the American troops, who now focus all their energy on a small town in the middle of the Ardennes. The fight for Bastogne is about to become the turning point of the Battle of the Bulge. As Modal's armoured spearheads plough towards the River Meuse, he now has to strengthen his advance. The rest of his forces and their supplies must catch up with the spearheads. But he needs to move this juggernaut through near impenetrable terrain. Particularly in places where you haven't got open fields or desert to drive over, you're constrained by the roads. And in that 
part of the world, in the Ardennes, all roads lead to Bastogne. The town of Bastogne is a hub for seven major roads across the Ardennes. Modal must take this town to move his forces west. The best way to take a town is to bounce it. That is to say, to get your guys in up the main road as quickly as possible and then set up a defensive perimeter before the other guy does. If the other guy's in there, you're going to have to fight him for it. And you don't want, particularly in places like Bastogne, where the crucial thing about it is that it's the big junction through which all your stuff's going to have to go. You don't want too much destruction. You don't want to flatten the place so that there are immense heaps of rubble covering every road. Ideally, you want it in one piece. Hugely difficult to achieve. General Bradley has to stop the marauding Germans from taking Bastogne, but he has just a small defence force in town. So he calls up a division of elite paratroopers to reinforce Bastogne, the 101st Airborne. The 101st, one of the greatest divisions in, in the history of, of warfare. And they, you know, cocky as hell. And when they were told, you're going to Bastogne, um, you're going to be cut off, one of them gives the classic answer, so what, we're always being cut off. They were used to the idea that being dropped into enemy territory, they were going to have to deal with probably armour and, and, and superior numbers by themselves until someone came up to relieve them. And so this was part of the game, as far as they were concerned. The only problem for Bradley is that the foul weather makes parachuting impossible. So the 101st have to drive nearly 200 kilometres in trucks. To buy time for them to reach Bastogne, Bradley sets up roadblocks around the town to hold up the German advance. On the evening of December 17th, Bradley's men dig in and get ready to take on the approaching German tanks. The most feared of all of Hitler's super tanks was without question the Tiger. It inspired a condition amongst the Allies called Tiger Phobia. I mean, it had an 88mm gun, which could defeat any of our armour at ranges of 2,000 metres. So for our tanks to defeat it at that kind of range was just out of the question. And even if you got close to it, the armour around the front was about 100 millimetres thick. So anything you fired at it just wouldn't get through. So how could you beat the Tiger? American foot soldiers find a way, with the most simple of weapons, a hollow tube that fires a rocket, the bazooka. Explosives engineer Sidney Alford will demonstrate how a small rocket can beat a Tiger tank. He aims a replica of a bazooka warhead at a target made of thick steel blocks. Firing! Four, three, two, one... Well, it, first thing is, there was a loud bang, so it went off. I see shattered wood, and I can see one piece of steel with a nice hole through it. Extreme slow motion reveals a thin jet emerging from the warhead. This is a hot needle of liquefied copper, which gives the bazooka its punch. The warhead is a shaped charge, a thin copper cone with explosives packed behind it. When they detonate, the cone is blown inside out and squeezed into a jet of white-hot liquid copper. When the rocket hits the target, this jet punches through the steel like a hot knife through butter. Any tank, once it has been penetrated by a shaped charge, is no longer invincible. The bazooka can penetrate up to 80 millimetres of steel, 
but the front armor of a Tiger tank is a whopping 100 millimeters thick. So how can a bazooka beat a Tiger? The only chink in its armor was at the sides, where the armor was maybe 80 millimeters thick, and certainly that's where bazookas could get through. So if you couldn't go to the Tiger, you had to wait for the Tiger to come to you. And that meant bazooka teams waiting in position, keeping their cool with this monstrous beast bearing down on you till it was perpendicular and then releasing the shot into the side armor. In one village alone, the Americans destroy 30 German tanks and kill 800 German soldiers. But most importantly, Bradley's men delay the German advance by two days. The 101st Airborne make it into town in the nick of time. They set up a formidable defense with tanks, anti-tank guns and artillery. Baston is now an ugly boil on Modal's operation. His spearheads are running low on fuel. If he can't establish a supply line through Bastogne soon, his offensive will grind to a halt. He orders his tanks to surround the town and lance the boil. General Bradley urgently needs to find more troops to relieve Bastogne, but his only option is politically difficult. The closest troops to the town are those of fiery General Patton, whom Bradley doesn't want to upset. Again, it is Eisenhower who takes action. Patton's whole army, over 20,000 men with all their tanks, vehicles and artillery, would have to turn north and cover nearly 200 kilometers of extremely difficult terrain in only two days. Then he has to punch through the German lines and establish a supply corridor into Bastogne moving all this kit from there to there in 48 hours, just the traffic control problem, changing the orders to the military police who are standing on crossroads doing that to these guys and saying, no, don't send them that way, send them that way, to hundreds of thousands of different people who've got to be told what to do next. But Patton has a key asset that will help him on his charge to Bastogne the Sherman tank. It's light, it's half as heavy as the Tiger, it's fast, I mean, you know, it goes nearly 40 kilometers an hour, and it's really maneuverable. Patton is short of trained tank crews, but luckily the Sherman is a cinch to drive. The stick system for the driver is very, very straightforward. Anyone can just get in and drive it. And so he wouldn't have had any problem finding just any old GI to just jump in here and make that journey to Bastogne to relieve the town. So off they went through the woods, and they were very confident they could do it in this vehicle. On the 20th of December, Patton's army begin their charge. When he asks Patton to ride to Bastogne's rescue, Eisenhower clearly ignores Bradley's opinion, and he does something even worse to his old friend. Bradley's headquarters is in Luxembourg City, south of the Bulge, cut off from his forces on the northern side. Eisenhower decides to hand over command of Bradley's northern armies to the highest ranking Allied commander in the area, British General Montgomery, a man Bradley hates with a vengeance. And Bradley gets into rage at that stage and says, I'm going to resign. And, and, and Eisenhower said, it's not up to you to resign, it's my decision. If anyone does any resigning, it'll be me. With Montgomery in charge in the north and Patton leading the relief of Bastogne, Bradley has effectively been sidelined.
Bradley was deeply hurt that his old friend had taken away two of his armies, given them to his most hated rival, Monty, and left him in charge of the one man who used to give him more grief than any other. I pat... While Bradley is sulking in Luxembourg, things are getting critical in Bastogne. The besieged Americans are now in serious trouble. They're completely surrounded by German tanks. The temperature has dropped to minus 12 degrees and they're running out of ammunition. The artillery has to stop firing to save its last few shells. The Americans are staring defeat in the face. On the 22nd of December, the Germans approach Bastogne with an ultimatum. Unless the Americans surrender, the Germans will flatten the town with all civilians in it. But the commander of the 101st Airborne, General Anthony McAuliffe, calls their bluff. And McAuliffe actually turned to his chief of operations, who was a lieutenant colonel, and said, what shall I say? And so this chap said, well, why don't you say what you usually say when you disagree with something? He said, what's that? He said, you usually say nuts. He said, that's it, nuts. Send that back as an answer, nuts. As day six draws to a close, the exhausted defenders of Bastogne fear an all-out attack by the German tanks the next day. Food is low, and so is ammunition. General Patton's rescue mission has run into heavy enemy defences and ground to a halt. Now the Germans have a real chance to break through. But as a new day dawns on the 23rd of December, fortunes are reversed. The skies have cleared. Now the Allies can finally exploit their air superiority. U.S. fighter bombers rake the German positions and tear through their hardware. And the Americans can finally parachute supplies into the besieged town. Among the crates of ammunition is a devastating secret weapon that rains fire down on the German attackers. It's an artillery shell that has a radar sensor called a proximity fuse. This fuse can detect when the shell is about to hit the ground and detonate it while it is still in the air. Explosives engineer Sidney Alford demonstrates why this gives the American defenders the edge over the advancing Germans. First, Sydney simulates a conventional artillery attack, a shell that explodes after it has buried itself in the ground. Four, three, two, one. Well, here we can see that it's exploded. It has shot through the sand and... By George! <laughs> that was... Pretty ineffective, I think. Anyone see any holes? Good Lord, I think that that amount of sand has saved the lives of all of these people. Well, I am very, very surprised that apparently um, not one of these soldiers received a single shot. However, what will be interesting will be to see what happens if there is no earth between them with an identical charge. Now, Sydney rigs a charge that simulates the proximity fuse. The theory of this is that it is a shell, exactly like the previous one. However, it senses when it is approaching the ground and it detonates before it hits the ground. This means that there will be no sand between it and these targets. Four, three, two, one. 
Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear. You look at the difference. The chap is clearly dead. One on his shoulder, but his belly is uh, shot to pieces. With the proximity fuse in their arsenal, the Americans grind down the German advances on Bastogne. Now that the town is so well defended, Field Marshal Model has to take stock. Every army teaches that if you're attacking a defended position, a trench in a field, you need an advantage of three to one. Most agree that if you're attacking an enemy that is in a town, which they've fortified for defence, they've put up sandbags and dug foxholes and they've strengthened houses so that they're more difficult to capture or take, that ratio goes up to 10 to 1. And from the moment that the Americans developed the defence of Bastogne, the Germans simply didn't have enough combat power to take them. Modal realises that without Bastogne, his chances of reaching Antwerp are slim. He now toys with the idea of reverting to the plan he failed to sell to Hitler. If he abandons the big offensive and stays east of the River Meuse, he could trap the American forces there and deal a crushing blow to the Allied war effort. And what's more, Modell's men might live to fight another day and defend their fatherland. Modell tries his idea on Hitler, but the Führer insists that Bastogne be taken and that German soldiers fight where they stand. On Christmas Day, Modell carries out the order. His troops throw everything they have at the Americans. The desperate German attacks on Bastogne meet fierce resistance. The American defenders repel Modell's troops again and again. Hitler's obsession with Bastogne costs Modell dearly. The focus on Bastogne, of course, has a dramatic effect on other units which have got further towards the eventual target of the Maas River crossings, like Piper's group, for instance who suddenly find that all the resources being concentrated on Bastogne means supplies aren't getting through to them, reinforcements aren't getting through to them. And that means that the successful deep attacks are grinding to a halt, not just because the logistics are stretched, but because the resources are being poured into the fight for Bastogne. Colonel Piper's tanks run out of fuel only five kilometers from his objective. He's forced to abandon them and retreat on foot. And to make things even worse for Modell, on December 26th, Patton's Third Army finally reaches Bastogne and opens a supply line into town. For Modell, Bastogne is now lost forever. The offensive is over. I think for Modell, the most difficult moment of all comes when he has to tell Hitler that they cannot go on. It must have been incredibly difficult. It was an admission of failure which had earned lesser men the death penalty. And it marked the absolute turning point in his relationship with the Führer for whom he had always been a success in the past. And I think that must have been, in every way, extremely difficult for him. But Hitler finally sees sense and allows Modell to retreat. Now the initiative is back with the Allies. They can finally start putting pressure on the German bulge and push it back towards the Rhine. But even in defeat, Modell's army is still dangerous. Their ability to shield each move and move back in contact 
always ready to counterattack, is rather like a boxer drawing his opponent in, going backwards, waiting for the best moment to counterpunch, raining blows all the way as they give ground. And Modal was an acknowledged master of this. If Bradley thought it was game over for Modal, he couldn't have been more wrong. The Americans lose more men chasing after the retreating Germans than in the initial attack. We constantly forgot how formidable the German army could be. However much damage they'd taken, they had this ability to bounce back. If you touched the Germans in an area which was important to them, their reaction was swift and violent and bloody, and you paid the price. But despite all Modal's best efforts, on January 16th, 1945, his troops find themselves back where they started one month earlier. Hitler's grandiose plan to divide and conquer the Allied invaders is the last battle cry of the Third Reich. His gamble costs him over 100,000 soldiers, destroys the cream of German armor, and leaves Germany almost undefended. For Modal, there is no consolation. On the 21st of April, 1945, he takes his own life. Omar Bradley returns to America a hero, celebrated as the winner of the biggest battle the US Army has ever fought. But it's a triumph that leaves a bitter taste. Bradley has lost over 80,000 soldiers. And much of the credit for the victory belongs to his rivals.